The city of Cape Town is appealing to the public to come forward and report any information regarding an attack on firefighters in Cryfontein. The incident occurred in the early hours of Saturday morning. Brackenfell crew members were deployed to an area there in the early hours of Saturday morning after receiving a call about a fire in the community. Cape Town's mayoral committee member for safety and security, J.P. Smith, joins us now to talk to us about this. Mr. Smith, good evening and thank you so much for your time tonight. What exactly happened? Um, I think you covered part of it uh, in that our officers received a complaint uh, to the call center. The fire department responded and uh, upon arrival two of the firefighters uh, moved in between the structures to go and investigate the source of the smoke uh, and were then assaulted by three men uh, at gunpoint uh, and robbed of whatever they had on them. Um, generally, the firefighters don't carry much by way of personal effects precisely to avoid these circumstances, uh, but even so, and it turned out that there was no structural fire, uh, and in fact, it appears to have been a hoax call for the purpose of luring firefighters uh, to the scene. This happened in Wallerstein, uh, adjacent to Cryfontein, and unfortunately, not the first time this year. I think we're on our fifth or sixth uh, assault on fire staff this year. Uh, of which one um, elsewhere in, um, I think it was uh, Elsis River, was particularly uh, traumatic for the staff. And the five or six incidents that you mentioned, were they also hoax calls? Not all of them. Um, some were legitimate fire calls where staff were ambushed. Other, one or two of them are hoax calls. So we have a, a red list of sites where we have had hoax calls before, where we don't respond without fire escort. And as these incidents happen, these areas become areas of, of um, cautious response. We don't declare anything a red zone ever where we never respond. But certainly you think twice, uh, your firefighters' lives matter to, you, to us a great deal. And we will not respond without a police escort. And that can slow things down quite significantly. Uh, and again, if the firefighters are injured or vehicles damaged, remember they are off run. And that means that station isn't covered and staff from an adjacent station then have to respond, which increases your response time by five or 10 or 15 minutes. So that's why we say it's in the public's interest to report to us if they know who's responsible for this so that we can hold them to account. Otherwise, the impact on the fire department affects everybody. And are you able to share some of those areas that uh, you are, you know, obviously saying that they're in the red now because you can't just go out because of safety concerns? We try not to have a static list, so SAPs from time to time, uh, usually twice a day, update us on any red areas. And then there are areas where the staff had uh, bad experiences uh, recently. Sikalo informal settlement is an example where the fire department uh, previously been ambushed and attacked, uh, where we will think twice uh, about going in because of the prevalence of, um, of muggings on staff. Uh, and again, you can't, you can't blame staff for being cautious. So that means sometimes a police escort is almost immediately available, but more often than not, that can delay the response by quite a bit. And certainly not only delaying the response and not only putting the lives of, you know, paramedics at risk, but also making it difficult for officials to go out when there's legitimate, legitimate calls that are being made. Well, I mean, <clears throat> some time ago, earlier this year, before the lockdown, one of our disaster management officials was inspecting an area in relation to fire risk, checking on fire hydrants, and he was mugged and, and shot at. And in fact, only because he's a fairly big guy, managed to fend off the assailant and pull, pull the gun from him, but he was almost killed. Uh, and so even the inspections of something like fire hydrants is something you have to approach with care. Uh, and this does make life a lot more difficult. It means that the areas where this happens are prejudiced, uh, because of slower response, if I can again quote uh, Isikalo, uh, informal settlement, uh, a place where we had a, a land invasion uh, not too long ago. Uh, that particular area, there was a fire recently when the officers arrived. There were four structures alight. Uh, they then entered the area, were assaulted, had to withdraw, wait for the police escort. And by the time they were then subsequently able to go in, there were 25 structures alight. And the people who assaulted them was the group of community so-called leaders who didn't want them to respond to the structures that they had set alight of a, a different community group.
And this is, of course, making the work very difficult, especially looking at the fact that Cape Town is an area that's also prone to some of the fires that we sometimes see on the mountains, sometimes, as you say, even the Shek fires themselves. Is, is it something that law enforcement authorities as well are managing to quell, particularly when you describe a situation like what you just described now, where people are setting structures alight and do not want police to go in? Uh, we identified a, a decent proportion or sizable proportion of the structures that we attended to as arson or purposeful or malicious firefighting. It's not a small percentage. By and large, fires are caused by negligence of people who fall asleep um, or become distracted and leave a fire unattended. Uh, no fire starts itself. Uh, fires are started by human intervention and generally get out of hand because people fail to pay attention to them or go to sleep with the fire still burning. Um, so we do a lot of awareness sessions to mitigate this, about 800 to 900 awareness sessions in vulnerable communities throughout a year. Uh, but this particular kind of malicious attacks on staff, no amount of awareness and discussion is going to do that. There we appeal to communities to do the right thing, protect your own interest by identifying the assailants if you know who they are, so that we can deal with them. We have lodged charges. In this particular case, uh, multiple charges were opened. Uh, but the chances of one effectively identifying or detecting the police persons are, are limited. We have even gone as far as fitting cameras to our vehicles to try and record the individuals um, and even at, uh, covered the windows of the vehicles with smash-proof tinting uh, to prevent uh, hurled items from being flung through windows. But that one staff have to work under these circumstances is very painful. It's not just a problem in Cape Town. It is a problem across the country, and it's particularly a problem for paramedics because they're more frequently assaulted even than fire staff, because fire staff are usually a team of three, four, or five, and multiple vehicles. The paramedics are very often uh, far more vulnerable and have more vulnerable items in their vehicles, so they're an even bigger victim to this particular problem. And certainly a concerning situation, as you say, bigger than Cape Town, because we have been seeing even here in Gauteng, um, in an area like Cosmos City, even last year we saw uh, a similar incident. But I want to take you through another incident which I'd like you to confirm for us as well. We understand two city of Cape Town law enforcement vehicles have been petrol bombed in Easter River. Can you confirm this, what happened there? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Uh, there was a complaint from the residents in the Bosasa development uh, in Easter River. Uh, and in this uh, housing development, uh, the, uh, the officers responded. It was a complaint about a new unit that had been completed that had been invaded by persons who were not the, the lawful beneficiaries. Law enforcement responded uh, to the complaint, engaged the persons who were occupying it. They voluntarily exited the structure. But uh, yeah, whilst this conversation and engagement was busy, somebody else went and, and, and threw a petrol bomb through the window of the, the one vehicle and very seriously damaged it. And uh, an attempt was made on a second vehicle where the damage was, was less significant uh, and, and repairable. But the first vehicle is basically a write-off. And again, this is unfortunately a situation with land invasions. Since 7 July, we have seen very intensive land invasions very much politically coordinated and uh, the very much targeting housing land that is scheduled for housing where budget is approved in this year. So we've lost around 1.1 billion rands worth of housing development that has been occupied uh, this year uh, by uh, about five to 7,000 structures. And unfortunately in that process, in the attempts at preventing this land from being occupied, uh, we have had numerous vehicles damaged. You will understand that at the moment this in Cape Town is a big crisis because of the South African Human Rights Commission court case, which makes it almost impossible now to defend the land. It, uh, or it makes it almost impossible for us to remove the structures. And between that and the Disaster Management Act Regulation 70, uh, under the lockdown regulations, uh, land invasions have been very effective um, and have unfortunately taken away a lot of housing development land. And in the case of Basasa, when we intervened, uh, this caused more damage to vehicles as it has in other areas. Have you made any arrests? Uh, in total, uh, in relation to the Basasa incident, I'm not aware of arrests, although they might have happened later this afternoon. In relation to the attacks on staff, uh, I think we're sitting on about 40-something, 40 48, 49 injuries, and about 30 of our vehicles damaged. We, um, to the, in the last account I saw, we'd made 143 arrests uh, so, yes, we're making a lot of arrests. Does anything happen to them? 
In terms of the criminal justice system, that's a little bit more of a complicated answer. And unfortunately, those levers are not within our control, but we have our own investigations unit that is working with the investigating officers or at least doing watching briefs, tracking those cases to try and ensure that there's consequences for those offenders so that it doesn't keep on happening. There's talk of a reward in the Busasa matter. Is it true? Yes, ma'am. We have a standard uh, system for reward. Again, with the uh, law enforcement units, these 500 staff in the five worst hotspots in the city that we rolled out, we were doing pamphlets uh, door to door. And there also we said to the residents in Hanover Park in that instant that if you bring information that leads to an arrest, the confiscation of firearm or drugs, or in this case, information leading to the arrest of a person responsible for those attacks, the uh, senior official is authorized to issue a reward of up to 5,000 rand, and there may be a further reward upon conviction. So we do try and incentivize informants. Uh, it is a, a common police practice throughout the world. You don't effectively fight crime without managing informants. And uh, the city has for some years been doing this, particularly in relation to gang violence, to deal with uh, firearms and drugs. And we get a fairly good range of tip-offs every week in this regard. All right. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Certainly, uh, you know, one can hope that some inroads will be made in these particular matters as concerns really mount around the safety of paramedics as they respond to various incidents across the country because the city of Cape Town is not the only one that is dealing with these incidents. We have been seeing some of them in Gauteng as well and in some other parts of the country. That was J.P. Smith from the city of Cape Town.